Yo, hell yeah. Wyatt begins in like uh, five, four, three, two, one. Yo, welcome to Wyatt. And I'm your host, Wyatt O'Brien Evans. Grr, woof, God damn it, woof, 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 woof. Hi. I said hi. All my YouTubers out there, if you like what you hear and if you like what you see, just click that subscribe button in the, at the bottoms of all your screens. And while you're at it, while you're at it, leave me some comments and give me some likes because I know you loves me. Anywho, today's Wyatt is a very special treat. I sit down with Mr. Terrence Day the innovative and award-winning poet and filmmaker. And Terrence is here to talk about his professional journey, which includes working with Spike Lee and Mara Brock Akil of Girlfriends and the Game fame. So all I can say at this point is let's get it on. So without further ado, Wyatt, I said Wyatt, welcomes the innovative and award award winning filmmaker and poet terrence day talk at me my brother how the hell are ya i'm great i'm doing good it's a great sunday i'm happy to be here and just excited to get into all the things today same here i want to thank you so much for dropping by wyatt man i greatly appreciate it and before i start i want to give a shout out to mr philip esteem the administrator of prideindex.com for connecting us. Prideindex.com recognizes and celebrates African-American and people of color, LGBTQ plus talents. So uh, I definitely want to give a shout out to him. So anywho, um, Phil interviewed you, Terrence, last year. Yeah, I'm going to steal a little bit from him. I'm sure he won't mind if he does, <laughs> if he does, well, whatever. But Phil interviewed you. Right, uh. <laughs> Phil interviewed you last year and he wrote, and I quote, your creative work reimagines traditional representations of black masculinity and male identity and invests strongly in destigmatizing mental illness within the black community, end quote. Let's dissect that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Where would you like where would you like to start with that? I mean, um, I think for me, yeah, I was I was just gonna offer my my entry point into that it comes from my own sort of upbringing, okay. my childhood, and my relationship to sexuality, to mental health, to all of these things. Mm -hmm. Um, which was I, I grew up in a in a pretty conservative Christian household. You know, my dad I come from a long line of pastors and educators. My dad is a pastor right. um, growing up on Long Island, New York. So uh, coming from the suburbs, but my dad's from East Brooklyn, my mom's from Jamaica, Queens. And so um, just kind of growing up and coming up in this environment where I think there was a lot of a lot of pressure sort of put on this idea of, you know, we, we, moved, we moved our family out to the suburbs to have a very specific kind of lifestyle mm -hmm. and experience that involves this track of education that involves sort of um, you know, all of this work and energy and effort that my parents put in, my grandparents put in, mm -hmm. and it's sort of, I just remember kind of coming into a lot of expectations uh, um, as a young kid that oftentimes I, you know, for whatever reason, just felt like I kept missing the mark on, mm -hmm. um, or at least felt like I need, if I didn't admit that, if I didn't hit that mark, that somehow my ideas of worth were tied up into that. And so obviously this notion of, of um, what it meant to be a man was also tied up into these ideas, um, into those expectations and being queer and identifying very early on my attraction to other men, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of, I could feel there's something about this that feels like it's, it's wrong. It feels like something yeah. I can't share. It feels like something I have to hide. And so I can really, long story short, I would say I was withholding a lot. Mm. Oh, I kind of taught myself to withhold, be small, you know, try not to make a target of yourself. 
Um, and I wasn't realizing the ways that mentally, self identity wise, I was beginning to create a narrative um, around myself that said, your worth is tied up into how well you can kind of fit this model of a black man. Um, and so I often say now that the work that I do is is invested in kind of interrogating what that even means right, right. Um, and trying to name sometimes the insecurity and the shame that I felt was born out of, you know, this sort of uh, this sense of like mental health and wellness and, and, you know, the depression that came about from it. Like I didn't have a language for any of these things. And so mm. when I talk about investing, destigmatizing mental health within the black community, it's specifically around creating language and tools for us to be able to have conversations, even for, within ourselves, within our own minds, to try to um, detangle some of that stuff that, you know, sometimes other people put on us, sometimes we put on ourselves, uh, just based off of, you know, sometimes those social, those social norms. You know, uh, Terrence, that's powerful. And a little bit later, um, because we at Wyatt are very nosy, we're going to get into your beginnings, your background, but what you just said is powerful. Let me throw another quote at you that I that really intrigued me. Um, and this is from another source. Uh, and I quote, Day's creative work reemerges everyday Black lives as a complex and nuanced spectacle, end quote. Let's dig into that a little bit because that's, that's poignant. Yeah, I appreciate you pulling all these um, uh one thing I always like to say about my work is I'm always really interested in misunderstood characters. Uh, um, yeah. I'm always interested in sort of, you know, cause that, that's, that's how I felt a lot of my life, but specifically uh, misunderstood characters who are longing for some type of connection. And so, uh, you know, those characters sometimes don't have to be the most incredible or amazing, or, you know, sometimes it's that, it's that person you overlook. It's that person that sort of in the background, I started off as a poet and a lot of, mm. I love details. I love kind of finding those small, seemingly insignificant things and finding the meaning in them right. and kind of finding the, the the larger idea in a small thing. And so similarly, when it comes to this notion of, um, uh, you know, like the quote was sort of saying, like there's something about the quotidian, the mundane that I'm interested in bringing forth this sort of idea of spectacle, this idea of like these everyday moments that have so much more meaning to them than we recognize. Um, these people sometimes that have so much more going on inside of their heads and their minds than you can think of when you first see them. I love to bring that to the forefront, both visually and narratively through storytelling. Mm, man, I like that. Now, this is the part of the show that I have to do this. Are you ready? I'm ready, I'm ready. Let me tell you something! You know, when I say <laughs> when I say that, it makes me feel a whole lot better. And I say that because, my brother, I want to be just like you when I grow up. Because right now, I'm going to break down your resume for our audience. Because I believe in giving everybody their just due. So here we go. Here we go. Mr. Day received his bachelor's degree from Morehouse College and his master's in fine arts and filmmaking at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. He is a two-time Spike Lee Production Fund recipient, a 2018 Sundance Ignite Fellow, the recipient of the 2020 New Fest Film Festival Emerging Black LGBTQ Plus Filmmaker Award and the 2020 Outfest Film Festival Programming Award for Engineering Talent. And y'all, there's more. Terrence's <laughs> film titled Ship, a visual poem, was awarded a short film jury award for U.S. fiction at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival and the Industry Jury Award at the RAPS 2020 Shortlist Film Festival. Terrence is also a 2020 Sundance, there's Sundance again, that 2020 Sundance Episodic Labs alum and a 2023 Project Involved Fellow. Now get this, he has assisted director Kyle Patrick Alvarez and written for the iconic showrunner, 
Mara Brock Akil on respective new projects, including the upcoming Netflix series titled Forever. Brock Akil was the creator of the showrunner for Girlfriends, The Game, Being Mary Jane, Black Lightning, and so much more. Additionally, Terrence's own highly anticipated animated short film, Pretty, is currently in development with Powerhouse Animation Studios. How did I do? You did incredible. Thank you so much. It it feels good to like, you know, just, just being a human being out here, you don't even realize sometimes mm -hmm. how you might impact and, and what you've done. So I, I thank God. I thank you for just the recognition. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share any any aspects of those stories because, you know, it, it didn't get there overnight. It didn't happen mm -hmm. overnight. Um, and I'm happy to to just share some of that journey here, here today. So thank you so much for for reminding me. <laughs> no, I mean, my pleasure, because I think, I'm, I think Taryn, sometimes we talents are kind of, uh, we're sometimes we're a little hesitant in tooting our own horns, and we've worked really hard for this. So <laughs> yep, people yep, need yep. to know, <laughs> you know. So thank you, thank you. Listen, man, my pleasure. Now, what I want to do is travel down the corridors of time so we can find out about your backstory. Because I, like I said, Wyatt folks are <laughs> nosy like that. <laughs> we are nosy. <laughs> yes, yes, come on. <laughs> so tell us, where were you born and raised? Born and raised, Long Island, New York. Uh, uh, grew up in Freeport and ended up moving to Dix, Dix Hills. If anybody knows, Nassau County to Suffolk County. Oh, okay. Okay, so now I like to ask my special guest this question because it's fun. And also it opens up a window into who you are today. So here it is. What was Terrence like as a little boy, a little nipper? Give us like three characteristics, traits, qualities, attributes that best described you. Oh gosh. I was definitely a little bad. I was <gasps> goofy and I was creative. Mm. <laughs> 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 okay. Yes, yes, yes. Now, were those two things you said? No, no. It was I was bad. I was goofy, and I was creative. Those are the two. okay. You, that was succinct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen, you flew me off by flow. I said okay. I was thinking that was two, but it was three. You got me. Oh, no. uh, no you let me know, man. I know we got time here today, but I I, uh, I like to answer the question specifically. But if you want, if you want me to give a little bit more, I can. But those are my answers. No, that that's good. That's good. You just, you know, I'm, I'm like, hey, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm an artist. We always thinking about like, like I I feel I'm in my body. I'm present. I'm with you here today. So I like I I, I probably probably thought about this in mm -hmm. terms of like I, I remember who I was as a kid. Well, I'm a talent too, and I better be a little more present for <laughs> doing this interview. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, having said that, you were a PK, a preacher's pastor's kid, right? And you Absolutely. talked about that a little bit. So let me ask you, you know, being in such a religious household, how did you, and you might have already touched on this earlier, but I'm going to ask anyway, how oh. did you finally really reconcile, you know, being a PK, a preacher's kid, and being gay, queer, same gender loving. Yeah. And how, was uh, it difficult for you to do that? It it, it absolutely was it, no more difficult than I feel like anybody who's, you know, uh -huh. had to experience sort of navigating who you are in the world versus like who the world sort of tells you that you can be there. Those perimeters. I, I was growing up in the early 2000s. And so, oh, yeah. you know, that came with its own distinct culture as well. Um, you know, this notion of like guys were just starting to wear like the pink polo shirts and pierce the earrings, but you could still be like, you know, uh, gay, like, but you know what I mean? Like, so it was just like, there was just, there was interesting, interesting uh, aspects and dynamics. Um, and what I want to say is like, you know, my parents are always really loving. Like my parents were always really loving, always really mm -hmm. accepting. I think these were things that in terms of like hiding my queerness or feeling the need to be small or withhold, I grew up in an environment that was always be big, take up space. Um, but I think I was nervous about that, right? I think just me and my own personal experience interpreted, 
I can't do that, right? Because it's like, I, if, if, I, if I do that, I'm putting a target on my back. And so I, I would say, as far as reconciliation goes, I always had, I always separated the two. There was my queerness, there was myself as, you know, a young Christian black man kind of growing up in the church. Right. Um, and, you know, there were all these different versions of Terrence. And I think it wasn't until I uh, sort of got to Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia, right. like I, when I kind of coming out of that household, coming out of that structure, being amongst an, a bunch of other young black men coming of age and recognizing that certain patterns, certain mindsets, I didn't want to keep and carry with me into the rest of my life. You know what I mean? It's sort of like all the doors are opening and flinging open wide. And I didn't want to carry, you know, certain things that I noticed about myself, right? Like I, I know in my head that I have this large interior life and thoughts and things, and I'm not letting myself live that or participate in life in any, in any way that like I would deem like, oh, this feels fulfilling and satisfying. Um, and so it was, I, I remember just sort of, it was, I mean, if I can pinpoint it to a specific moment, mm. I was flying home. I was flying home from Atlanta. The plane was landing. I was looking at the plane. And as like the ground was getting close, I just started crying. I just burst into tears. Oh, wow. um, and I, it was just this this feeling like I I want to participate. I need to overcome this fear. So I ended up like coming out to my dad. And that, that was my like, uh, that, I did have that traditional coming out experience. And, you know, he cried and I was crying. And oh, but it, it was just such, it was such a relief. And I think that seeing how my parents still loved me, even as they didn't fully understand all the time, exactly, you know, what do we do now? It, it became a, in, its, in and of itself a faith journey of like, you know, I know some people have bad experiences with their parents or bad household mm -hmm. households where they can't, you know, they can't overcome that language barrier. But even though we didn't have the language, we knew the love was there and the love was intact. And so out of a, out of a desire to figure this thing out together, you know, I decided to stay and be present and work it out with them. And they decided to stay and be present. And so um, that reconciliation came from that foundation of love. Man, that is really beautiful. You have evolved. You have parents who are evolved. And yeah, yeah they're, they're, that is so good. Um, let's talk about your college years, Terrence, because I believe you said that's where you discovered filmmaking. So uh, tell us how you honed your craft during those years and just tell us about the Morehouse and the Tisch experiences. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's that, that one we're going to get, get a little into it if I, if I, if I may. Oh, sure. Please. Um, because um, I, as I mentioned, I started off in poetry. And mm -hmm. so that started uh, as early as um, middle school, elementary, maybe even. I was given a, an assignment to write a haiku for class. And, you know, I told you I came from a, a, a household that education was very big. And mm -hmm. so I was reading a lot. My mom was always reading chapter books to me. And um, just this notion of like five, seven, five, five syllables, five, you know, that the form, the structure of it all. Um, there was something about doing haikus for that class assignment that I just found invigorating and fun. And it was like, oh, you know, you can you can say something larger you know, in these small kind of couplets of tri triplets of words and phrases. And mm -hmm. there was something about that that really intrigued me. And I remember when my teacher first read, uh, I wrote more than one. And when my teacher read them, I remember she was like, you wrote these, you know, there was just, just that encouragement. Um, she, she was just impressed and that always stayed with me. And so I always said from then on that I wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. I said I wanted to write poetry and uh, to create a writing classes in high school in middle school, which it was like an elective, it was a, it was an after school club in uh, middle school. And then in high school, it was a, it was an elective. Okay. And I took that and that's really in that environment, in that space was where I was learning, you know, T.S. Eliot, Robert Frost, uh, you know, learning all these different, different poets, mainly white, you know, mainly white, mainly uh, Western. I, I was, gonna, but yeah, I was I thinking was that too, cutting, but that's, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I was cutting I was cutting my teeth and every Friday we had to share and I oh, shared okay. every Friday and we would get feedback from the class like out loud. So like also practicing um, sharing the work and getting feedback on the work. Um, and, and initially that that class was literally just like a, a two semester elective. Mm -hmm. But I, myself and another classmate, uh, we took it every single semester. Um, and so he my teacher had to start coming up with like new things for us to do. So he started getting us into plays. He started us reading books. He started us writing short stories. He started us, he was just pushing us and recognized mm. that we had an appetite for it. 
a hunger and a desire started to make us apply to different um, competitions and different things like that. And, you know, then there, there was that competitiveness between myself and that, and that, and that friend, her name was Sabrina. And we would like, you know, try to, we would kind of almost like, like understand that we took this seriously. You know, that's when, that's when it really became real for me. And I didn't know a lot of other young black men who were writing poetry on the page. Absolutely. You know, um, I also had exposure to spoken word poetry at some point, but I was specifically in love with writing poetry for the page. And um, one of the first black poets I met who that did that was Terrence Hayes, who also had my name. And so I, there was that, <laughs> there was just a dream very early on of going to, um, of being like a, a poet laureate, of going to mm. um, school to study uh, poetry in a significant way. I'd won some awards. I'd um, won a national prize um, through this, uh, this this incredible sort of um, competition and thought I was bound to study poetry in college. Um, but what ended up happening was I, I didn't get into any of the schools I applied to. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I said I came up in that kind of suburban space where if you want to go into an Ivy League school, it's kind of like, what are you doing? Uh, and so when I did get into Morehouse, which was the only school that had accepted me and the one school that I said I did not want to attend oh. because I did, I wasn't aware of the, even though my, I had family who went there and a cousin who went there, um, it was where my parents really wanted me to go. And I was worried that, you know, they were going to use my cousin as an extended sort of surveillance <laughs> and that I wouldn't actually be able to have a college right, experience. Right. I also, I got it. I also, you know, knew Morehouse didn't have a creative writing program, but long, long story short to jump over uh, the undergrad experience, uh, I ended up going to Morehouse mm -hmm. and I was trying to figure out what I was going <clears> to <throat> do next because they didn't have a creative writing program. And so I thought I was going to, um, kind of do English and music because my dad, before he became a pastor, was a chorus teacher. And oh, so I grew okay. up on music. I grew up around a lot of singing and I wanted to be a musical theater book writer, which is the the person who does the sort of like book for musical theater. Mm -hmm. That's where I was thinking in terms of like a day job. How can, what can I do and practice and learn in this space? That was where my thought process was. And so I was in the music rooms practicing every morning during like the fall semester of my freshman year. And one day one of the professors said, you know, you're in here all the time. What do you want to do? You know, what, like, what do you want to major? And I said, well, I want to write creatively, but there's no creative writing program. And he said, you should consider the script writing classes they offer in the film program. Mm. And that's the first time film ever kind of came on my radar. Um, and, uh, I went home and feverishly was looking up what a script was and saw that it was similar to playwriting. And then I discovered TV writing specifically and noticed a lot of similarities between poetry and TV writing specifically in the form and structure. And, and so it, it became this like new sort of feverish excitement of like, oh, wow, there are so many applicable skills that I have for this thing that I know nothing about. But I, you know, I love movies. I did love TV like most people. And so I threw myself into, I decided to make my major film and threw myself into learning everything I could about film and TV and specifically from a writing yeah. standpoint. I hadn't yeah. begun to think of myself as a director yet, but I'll, uh, I'll stop the story there. But that's sort of, that's how I got into the film TV of it all. And that's how, you know, the role I guess Morehouse played for me. And, and in that time also began to get exposed to Black literature, Black art, Black artists, um, Black films, Black filmmakers. And that really opened my purview in a really beautiful way that allowed me to go into NYU sort of galvanized with a point of view and something to say. Well, my brother, you be industrious and resourceful. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, you, <laughs> you, you do it. That's great. So now how was the Tish experience? Now, the Tish experience was certainly a hard one. Like, oh, no. um, you know, the film school isn't for everybody. Right. Uh, I thought it was for me because I, um, most of the work and skills that I grew during my time at undergrad were predominantly in uh, writing. Mm. And so I learned the craft of script writing. But ha and, and we, of course, were learning things like production and film, but Morehouse's program um, at the time, it was primarily focused on writing, the history of film and television, um, and theory. Okay. And so, right, it wasn't until our senior year that we got to, you know, get cameras in our hands and actually begin to apply on a practical production level some of those things. And so I knew that 
when it came time to go to grad school, I wanted to try to expand my knowledge of some of those things. And this is all predominantly to make me a better writer. Mm-hmm. But during my time at NYU, where I, um, I, I would often say I bumped up against a lot of what I wasn't, which honed who I ended up becoming. Uh. And, you know, so it was sort of like um, uh, in these environments, you're often taught this is the sort of canon of films you need to see and things that you need to check out. And mm-hmm. while it was all great stuff, um, I didn't see anything that felt like me or looked like me or, or you know, even at the time, because I was coming from this poetry background, a lot of the work that I was doing would be described as experimental or abstract. Um, and so I was looking at people like uh, Kalula Joseph. I was looking at people like Arthur Jaffa, Terrence Nance, Julie Dash. Mm-hmm. Um, I was also drawing inspiration from literature, Toni Morrison, and from poetry, um, from other places that wasn't predominantly film. And Oftentimes I would be reminded this is a narrative based program and I would I would struggle at times to find myself in this space Mm. that I did feel like I was supposed to be in and that I just tried to continue to figure out how can I take the tools and lessons that I'm being taught here, but also bring them into my own canon. You know what I mean? Like bring them into the things that I'm watching that I am aware of that aren't necessarily being taught as the greatest films in, you know, in, in, in history. And so anyway, that. I would say that that was a lot of my experience at NYU was really learning how to take the sort of facts of this business and of this industry and of the sort of like standard of this creative field, but kind of funnel them through who Terrence is and what Terrence has to say and what I want to do. And and so um, that was a very unique experience. It was a very hard experience at times, isolating. Mm. Um, but I did find incredible support and in, um, going through that program. Uh, obviously, Spike was there and Spike was a huge support. A lot of faculty that were really supportive and um, was really happy to come out of that program, um, feeling all the more sharpened and galvanized as a filmmaker. Hmm. So what's Spike Lee like? Spike is Spike is a character. Like Spike is certainly <laughs> like the characters that you see him playing. That kind of like high energy. That kind of like they always got something to say. Like Spike is definitely like a, a force. Um, he's a Morehouse brother for sure. Yeah, okay. uh, uh, but I would say like uh, in both of those times where I was uh, given an opportunity from Spike, I didn't see it coming. Uh, and so we would have office hours, we would talk, we would share work and Spike will, will grill you on your stuff. And, and a lot of times I was, I, I'll be the first to admit, I wasn't always prepared for the grilling that, you know, he would give, um, it would come out of left field. It would right. be one day it might be this, it might be something else, but he would, he would grill you and he would give it to you, you know? And I feel like, um, uh, you know, I would have to try to be quick on my feet and try to answer a question. And I'm not even sure if it was a matter of, of being impressive or, or what, but I think, um, uh, in both cases, I was I felt really honored but surprised mm. that um, that he saw what it was that I was trying to do. Um, that he kind of reached out. You know, there was that Morehouse connection, but you literally never know. Um, but he, in, in both cases, he reached out and was such a pivotal um, force in helping me to get both of those projects made. Mm. Excellent, excellent. Okay, Terrence, let's move on to what I call your big three. So far, anyway, Uh, the film Chip, a visual poem, the upcoming Netflix series Forever, and then Pretty. So let's start Mm -hmm. with Chip. Tell us about that. It was an award winner at Sundance. Yes, um, that actually generated from uh, a TV pilot that I had that I was working on. I was really passionate about the idea came to me in 2016 um, based off of a, a real life story and article and um, I was at the time trying to figure out the pilot mm-hmm. and was going into my second year at NYU, where we have to focus on developing um, a, a kind of like 10 minute short film. Mm-hmm. And I knew that I didn't want to leave the world of this TV pilot that I was developing because obviously I was in film school. Television wasn't necessarily something they were teaching at the time or like prioritizing. So that was something I was doing on my own after class. Um, and so I didn't want to leave the world of that space. And um, I was trying to figure out a way to figure out that, that story for television. Mm. It was a story of a young black man sort of uh, in, in, at the intersection of, of sexuality, race. Um, and it felt like I was playing with things that, that did not fit in the same world. Um, mm. Specifically this idea of like, uh, of queerness 
of race, of grief, of family. Like sometimes it felt like a, a, a hard way to sort of put it all into one container and not have it be overwhelming, mm-hmm. not have it be, you know, all over the place and confusing. And so I decided that for that 10 minute short film I do for my second year, that I was going to take an, an, as, an aspect of the pilot and condense it down into this container, this short film, okay. and try to figure out if I could say it, all the things that I wanted to say at once. Um, and so that, I, I would say hyphen chip was an experiment. Um, it was an experiment to say, "Can I do this?" And um, mm. uh, I didn't. I didn't think I had achieved it. Um, honestly, I thought um, I had thought. You know, I took a good swing at it. But I, um, you know, the first initial reactions at school to the project were not the reactions that would come later. Um, the, rea- yeah. the reactions were kind of like hard to read at first. Um, and so I, it was a project that I kind of, you know, I knew I needed to finish it. But it wasn't one that I was kind of putting a lot of uh, faith in, I would say, at the time. Um, and I had applied to Sundance because of my relationship with them through the Sundance Ignite program. Mm-hmm. And they oftentimes would come back and ask us, hey, do you have something you want to share? And one of my uh, one of the members from my cohort, Crystal Caiza, she saw an early cut of hyphen ship and said, you know, you should apply. Um, and so I had applied and forgotten about it. And they um, they called me and let me know. And I think once they told me that the film had gotten in, it was like, what? Okay, I I'm, I feel wholly unprepared. I don't know how to how to do this. I've never I've never done a, a film festival before in this way where it's like a big deal. And you're going. You got to have PR. You got to have all these things. And I just decided, hey, take it one step at a time. It's okay that you don't have all of the things. Just go and have the experience. Mm-hmm. It's going to be your first time experience. You hope one day to be back. Just go have the experience. And I realized that it wasn't until I shared the film with my parents and I saw the conversation we were able to have based on the film that my relationship to the film began to change. And Uh the things that I did not think worked, I began to realize Mm. that, uh, that they did right. That, 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 that like, because that they were good enough. Like I was able to have the conversation with my parents, which, which to me, I've always been in the kind of filmmaker that's not always looking at the technique and the, that I get it pitch perfect because I have my whole career to figure it out and get it right. But can I impact the audience that this was intended for? Can we have the conversations that I want to have? And um, I was able to have a, a dip, my relationship to the film and the film screening and premiering at Sundance was all the better because I had shared it with my parents and had that conversation. And that's kind of where art comes from for me. And then we ended up um, uh, ended up winning, which I always just give that to God because uh, I was that was the last thing on my mind was not expecting that. Mm. You know, Terrence, having such an invaluable parental support system is just wow. That is just absolutely. That's just absolutely. I was I was scared to show it to them. I was scared. I was scared what they would say. You know, because I I'd done some films up until that point and. Uh, I feel like they were getting to know different sides of me from the films that I, I was doing, the things that I was making. And sometimes I'd feel like, man, I hope, I hope they, I wonder what they would think about, about this or about that, or about me wanting to talk about this. And um, th- that was the hyphen ship. You know, there's this, like I said, the intersection of like religion and sexuality and, uh-huh. and a little bit of mental health. And, you know, it just, it seemed like, how can I put it all into one container mm-hmm and not break that container, right? Like, how can I make it just, I like just enough? Yeah, just enough that it's legible for people and there's an entry point, but I'm not holding back any punches. Um, and mm. so that, that that was that experiment. And I would say that um, that taught me a lot about writing. It helped me figure out that TV pilot, which I would end up going to the Sundance Episodic Labs for, mm-hmm. uh, also in 2020. Um, and, uh, and that, I mean, just kind of dipping into forever, it was that TV pilot that would end up also being a big factor in getting me the job um, for the Mar Rocket Kill uh, Netflix show. So it's so funny that that uh, hyphen ship does kind of it's it's a branch of this television project that sort of allowed me to begin my career as a TV writer. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm extremely grateful for what hyphen ship taught me that allowed me to be a better writer as a result. Well, let's talk about the upcoming Netflix series Forever. This is what I want to know. <laughs> this is what I want to know. 
What's it like to work with Mara Brock Akil? She is a legend. She's an icon. You better be, you better be on your piece. Have your shit together. You better have your shit together because um, Mara doesn't play. You know what I mean? Mara, like Mara, from the first day, she knows what she wants and she knows what she's going for. Mm -hmm. um, she's going to tell you like I like to work and I work hard. Um, and so, you know, I feel like that just set, it set a tone. I mean, it's, it's Mara Brock a kill. And so she carries a level of a button up to begin mm -hmm. with. But I think also just like, uh, but she leads with a level of grace. Um, she leads with just a, a really warm spirit, like, and a warm energy. It's it's cool to kind of get into a space and, and see why somebody got to where they are. I think she's also one of the most, uh, uh, she's going to speak into existence what she wants to see, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, and so it's it so it sort of like, if you're if you're in a room with Mar Barker Kill, you better be ready for wherever she wants to take that train, because... You know, like I said, like you, you really kind of got to buckle up and, and be ready for it. So um, I would, I always describe her as a force. Um, she's a force. I think her Instagram title is in the land of Mara, and it certainly is a land that is all uniquely her own. So um, uh, I, I had a great. That was, in, in, I couldn't ask for a better first time writer, writer, writer experience, um, and learned a lot going through it. Well, you know, you can look at her and tell that she is a force that she doesn't play. She has a warmth about her, but it's like, look, I'm here to do the work and I expect that work to be done extremely well. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's no That's better environment. Like yeah, there's no better environment when you are, you know, a young up and coming artist than to sit under somebody that does have a standard for their work. Um, mm -hmm. It just makes you, it makes you better. And I have, I have a standard for my own work anyway. But I think when you're working with somebody that that is also sort of like, you know, we're we're we have to operate as a team and we got to get this thing up the mountain. It just it's a different kind of machine. And for the bulk of those people, it's very rare that it, it's you look around, it's all people of color mm. doing that, doing that, um, that lifting. Um, that's also what was very unique about that experience. And she's one of those the one of those uh, uh, TV kind of veterans that can command that level of, I want to have a all black room. You know what I mean? If I want to hire and have a room that, that has, that's like all people of color, um, that's diverse, that doesn't have the same hierarchy that you can expect in, in, in certain writers rooms. Um, she's able to kind of create the experience that she wants, um, which sometimes can be just a little bit outside of the norm mm. of the Hollywood system. And I feel like she did exactly that. And uh, um, I'm excited for for the for the series to come out and for people to experience her uh, her vision. Now, forever is adapted from the Judy Bloom book, and Judy Bloom is a writer of children's young adult and adult fiction. But originally, wasn't that book? Didn't that book contain all white characters? Is exactly so. Mara yeah. is flipping the script. Because exactly. So tell us about Forever. What's the synopsis? Yeah. So Forever is about a, a young a young girl. Uh, she's growing up, coming of age for the first time. In, in terms of, we're exploring a lot of her first. So her first um, boyfriend, her first relationship, and uh, we're we're the first time having sex. Her first kiss. It's all of the first. And it was a seminal at the time in the seventies because nobody was writing with that level of like intimate detail uh, a young girl you know wondering what it would be like to to have sex wondering what it would be like uh to have a relationship are we going to be together forever or are we feeling these feelings just because we've never felt them before um you know uh and judy bloom kind of knocked it out of the park uh and so you know there's when mara kind of she grew up loving this book okay and when she sort of had the opportunity to return to the material all these years later, having, you know, been a mother and just sent her son off to college, her thought in her vision and adaptation of forever was to flip the script in terms of bringing it into the personal experience that she had, which is growing up in LA, but also changing the character, which was a young female protagonist into a young black male protagonist uh, coming up in LA in 2016, right around the time of, you know, mm. the, the, coming into office and um, dealing with a lot of these firsts of sort of like first relationship, first love, but also, you know, what my life is going to look like and be like as a black man going out into the world outside of the sort of 
maybe bubble even of my home life that I that I that I have out in LA. So it it was it was incredibly it was it was incredibly um, creative, honestly, mm-hmm. to kind of take all of these things and flip them on their head. And we don't get to see young black men coming of age uh, often t- uh, enough on screen, especially given the Netflix treatment of a kind of that kind of uh, uh, stylish sort of coming of age feel to it uh, as a teenager. Um, and so I thought that was really cool. And that's what attracted, attracted me to it. I, I love coming of age stories. I love romance stories. Um, and so I was like, sign, sign me up all day, every day. I love relationship. You know what I mean? Like I said, those misunderstood characters, the sense of connection and all of that is in there. So um, I was having a field day. Now, I believe that Forever is the first in Ms. Brock Akil's multi gazillion dollar deal with Netflix. Yes. And I and I, I hope it continues on. I mean, when you get a, like Mara has stories for days. Um, and so I'm like, I feel like she has no shortage of opportunity to create any number of series in Netflix. Um, but she's certainly like, she, she's just a creative, you know, like I said, like she's a, she's a force both creatively as a person, as a, as a human being, uh, as a, as a mentor, as a mother figure, like, uh, she's, she's, she's the whole package. So I have no doubt that this will be the first of many to come out of that deal. Well, I wouldn't mess with her. But uh <laughs> that's a, yeah, no. Listen, she's 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 gorgeous, but I wouldn't mess with her. No, no, no baby. Don't let that fool you. Don't let none of it fool you. <laughs> so Terrence, now when does uh Forever air on Netflix? Do you have is there a release date yet or uh... No, they just finished uh they just wrapped up filming oh, okay. uh production out in LA. So uh we're all standing by waiting to see um what the process is. But as y'all know, uh we just came off of the strikes. Um, yeah. You know, writers, the, the industry has been, been con- feeling a contraction, but writers have been feeling it, especially so many, yeah. so many people that I know, um, you know, uh, are, are sort of are, are going through it. So I feel blessed to have a, a, a series coming out on air um, and uh, we'll find out what, what, what the, uh, the state of it will be um, very soon. Well, you know what, really quickly, I'm going to deviate because of what you just brought up, because I've been reading, I read Deadline and the Hollywood Report on a regular basis. And Deadline has this whole series now about what the contraction, you know, what the, the contraction has done to Hollywood. So many writers and producers and and highly paid executives have lost their jobs and they are not able, they're not coping with it very well mentally and emotionally. So um, that's pretty tough. Absolutely, absolutely, and like like I said, um, it's it's sort of like that's that's why I can say it's it's a it's a real blessing to be able to even uh, have a have have my name on a, on an episode of TV coming out during this specific time because it is hard and to have worked under somebody that is in a position that they can weather a kind of storm like we just kind of went through with that. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so it, it, it's certainly a very unique time for the business, mm-hmm. but I'm all the more optimistic. You know, I think that like, if, if I took anything away from that, that experience, it is, you know, cream rises to the crop, uh, to the top and to continue to hone your craft, to continue to be on your P's and Q's and be sharp and, and, and wait for that moment, anticipate that moment, anticipate that next opportunity. Um, cause it, it can, it can come tomorrow. It can come in two years but you want to be just as sharp as you are now so that you're ready to, to kind of, um, to break through, to have, to be able to participate. Um, Cause it's such a, it's a, such a blessing to even be able to participate, to share stories. Like I said, to connect with audiences, it's, it's therapeutic for me, but it's also, you know, something that when you get to share it with other people and have that kind of collective experience, mm. it, it doesn't happen every day. You don't, you don't always get it. It's not guaranteed. Like you said, people have been losing jobs, who have been losing their deals it's not guaranteed. And so, um, so I've been, I've just been very fortunate and taking every opportunity that I can to, uh, to be observant and to learn um, and to apply. And you have to have an unshakable faith in yourself as well. Um, okay. Now what's the nitty gritty on pretty? Did you like that? What's the nitty gritty on pretty? Yes. Well, you know, it's your highly anticipated animated short. Of, uh, I'm sorry. 
No, I was saying I was saying you, you said unshakable faith, and I was oh. like that that project encapsulates oh. unshakable uh, faith because um, uh, Pretty was meant to be my senior year thesis at NYU following high ah, ship. Okay, um, it's a project. It's a coming of age story that I that I came through came to through the author at the time. It was an unpublished manuscript, oh. but Pretty is uh is a is a is a book it's out now um p-r-i-t-t-y by keith f miller jr um who if you haven't gotten a chance to meet i highly highly recommend um because keith is also another force um oh. I'm, I'm i'm grateful to have uh many forces in my life keith f miller jr being one karen rose bruning who helped me produce hyphen chip being another um but uh but keith is one of those people that um, you know, we kind of became pen pals. I met him through uh, his. He had a a, a a series called Pillow Talk uh, that was sort of this sort of um, a digital interview online series where he'd interview different artists oh. and um, that we would speak about vulnerability and art and the relationship to those two things in the lives of Black men. Mm. And um, and we became quick pen pals and we would share different um, uh, things we were working on. And he gave me this three hundred page unpublished manuscript that I read on a plane ride from LA to New, to, from uh, New York to LA. And the first thing I said, uh, when I, when I put it down, I wrote him, I said, audacious. Like it was the, the nerve of you to think that you're going to tell a story of a young black boy growing up in Savannah, Georgia, um, you know, and, and to have all mainly almost all of the, all of the characters, all of the black male characters, all of the characters were uh, going through some form of journey with themselves mm. and identity and their sexuality. Normally you see like one, right? Normally you see one, you don't see multiple. And I think having gone through Morehouse and understanding how complex and nuanced black men could be, I thought it was extremely audacious that Keith even had the vision to say, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to allow these characters to be who they are and to, and to be figuring it out in real time. And to not, to, I know it's not a world that my audience is used to seeing, but it is a world that exists. Mm. And so I'm going to, I'm going to put that, um, put that out there for you. And, and I, it stuck with me. I read it in 2018 and it wasn't until 2019 that I approached him about doing it as a, um, as a, as a short film. Oh. And so uh, that's where our creative um, history began and, 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 blossomed in this really beautiful way um, where we developed the project. We got some funding from Spike Lee to do it as a live action. Nice. Film. Yeah. As a live action short film that we were planning to shoot in Savannah, Georgia in March of 2020. Okay. And we know uh, what happened yeah. then this, you know, the pandemic hit. And this is why I say it's a project of such an unshakable faith mm -hmm. um, because we had gotten this funding, we'd gotten the crew, we developed it for about nine months, you know, leading up to uh, production before we had to stop yeah. in the way the world did with that level of uncertainty of we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if we're going to be filming it anymore. But but I said, I just I just this is a project I felt passionate about. Keith felt passionate about because I said young black boys deserve and specifically queer men of color deserve to be able to project themselves into the future in the way that like coming of age stories do. There's something about watching a coming of age story as an adult that allows you to reimagine your future differently um, because you're looking at somebody wrestle with thoughts and feelings and emotions that you, you yourself have had to wrestle with, but sometimes you get to watch them make a different choice than the one you got to make. And I think that there's something beautiful about being able to cast yourself onto a person that looks like you having those experiences and kind of you get to tra time travel in that way in a really beautiful way, but also think about yourself in the present moment and how you can make decisions and choices now that can affect and impact your future later. And so that's why I love the genre. That's why we were very adamant about figuring out a way to tell this story despite there being a pandemic. Okay. And animation presented itself as one of the few mediums that you could still work in during that time that allowed for the remote sort of um, process that, you know, that, that was happening at the time. And so um, I did some cold calls. You know, I think ignorance was truly on my side in that way and that like I had never done it before, but I'm a huge fan of animation. Mm -hmm. Ended up get the first people we asked were the people that for the first yes that we got, you know, it was, we didn't ask any other about any any other person but Powerhouse Animation Studios, um, and I found them through just looking up black animation, <laughs> you know, independent 
online and I found Tuskegee Airs, uh, which is a, a, a web comic that was being developed into a, a try, they were trying to make it into a TV show. And I got a chance to connect with the artist and talk to him about his Kickstarter campaign and what he did and learned what an animatic was and uh, which is uh essentially able to make a sort of rough line drawing that's not the full colored animation but I, I learned so much um and powerhouse animation studios came on board and we had so much material that we made it we made it happen we made it work and developed a bunch of assets raised just under one hundred fourteen thousand dollars through kickstarter in 2021 and, um, we're still on the journey with it mm -hmm. uh we released um uh two years ago we released the the full animatic for the entire short film so you can go watch the short film based off the viral nature of the kickstarter keith got a multi-book deal with harper collins to release what was initially a unpublished manuscript that was sitting on his desktop for 12 years that he just sent to me on a whim Whoa. now is a book that you can go purchase in bookstores right now um, and the second one together is coming out as well. Um, so I'm so proud of him. I'm so proud of the, just to me, like I said, it's just a, it's a project of faith. Um, we're still uh, fundraising and still on that journey to, because animation is expensive yeah. and long and arduous, especially independent animation, especially independent animation with people of color. Um, uh, it's, it's a journey and I, I take my hat off to anybody on it, but uh, I love animation. It was a. It opened up a whole new world for me. Keith and I started our uh, independent production company, Blue and Scott. I Pictures, was going to ask you about that. With the aim of mm -hmm. telling more diverse stories um, around uh, people of color within, and queer people of color specifically, and stories of color within the animated space. Um, and so, uh, it's 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 been a dream to to be able to work with people who I love and respect to maintain those relationships through such incredible highs. Um, and to, to watch our careers take off in that, in that beautiful way. But there's no better feeling than to feel like you were part of somebody's uh, story getting out into the world. And so um, I always say I could rest happy knowing that uh, Keith got that book out there and that people have that book. A Black kid has the opportunity to pick that book up, but also to Google Black queer animation and where we struggle to find images and comps to share with Powerhouse Animation Studios mm -hmm. to be like, this is what we're trying to do. Somebody can discover pretty um, and have a have a have a comparable for their next thing. So I hope we're we're not the we definitely weren't the first, and I hope we're definitely uh, not the last. But um, I'm glad we were able to pierce the conversation in a significant way. Awesome. Now, before we go, and thank you for such a enlightening and absorbing interview. Here is a delicious question for you. Okay, Mr. Day. Which deceased filmmakers of the last century would you invite to a dinner party and why? And what would you talk about? Uh, Mike Nichols. Uh, I want to talk to to Mike Nichols, who is a prolific uh, filmmaker, theater, theater maker, um, uh, known for The Graduate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I... I, I what I love about Mike is uh, I love the way that he took the, he had, a, he understood the audience. Uh, he grew up kind of, or he came up doing kind of improv and, and, and uh, uh, sketch comedy with his kind of scene partner, Elaine May. Mm. And the two of them just, uh, you know, kind of cut their teeth doing kind of uh, improv duo almost and kind of like being in front of audiences. I didn't just know the that. Two okay. Yeah, just two two about bodies about on a stage, um, sort of you know working out in a, a, a working out improv and you know well oiled routines to kind of get get you know to get the audience on their side to win them over to make them laugh all these things that would eventually be applied to his films and I think he just has such beautiful things to say he has a he has a quote that I like to say which is um, the subconscious is the is your best collaborator. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he, just under, he understood um, comedy, he understood drama. Um, he also understood the how to bring theater, the theatrical experience to film in a beautiful way. So he's one of those people I could talk to all day. Um, I always think Toni Morrison is a filmmaker. Uh, you can find me on that. But Toni, like when you read Toni's work, it is so cinematic. Mm -hmm. And so even when I would go to film school, people would say, who's your favorite filmmaker? I said, Toni Morrison. Um, because I, I think the woman just had a way uh, with imagery 
Um, and even even if she never touched a camera, um, I think that woman uh, uh, certainly knew how to make a film. Um, and so um, she's just somebody I would want to speak to because I think that she also understands how to take uh, uh, themes, mm -hmm. big big ideas, but humanize them and bring them down into characters that are relatable. Um, and also how to direct our attention. Like when you look at The Bluest Eye or mm -hmm. Song of Solomon, it's sort of like where she guides the thread like where she decides to lead us in right. as a, as readers, um, what she decides to show us when those choices um, all like lead to allowing that theme to hit and penetrate you in a way that is extremely profound, that is extremely delicate. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. and and she she that's another one of those people where I'm like I I get I just want to listen to you talk, um, and I would say probably that. Uh, that last person would be uh, well. They're not deceased. Um, uh, can I? Can they? Do they have to be deceased? Yeah, or? You do it. Okay. okay so if, oh, <laughs> I can't. I can't cheat on that one. I can't cheat on that Go one. Go ahead and do it. Um, do it. Hmm. Uh, uh, it was going to be a uh, uh, Hayao Miyazaki. Oh, um, okay. Who's sort of uh, an animation uh, filmmaker, but um, and he and, and thankfully he's still with us. Um, but he understands uh, quiet and subtlety mm. and um, and the power of those two things, the power of silence um, and the the power, I, I believe, of sort of, he never dumbed down, he never dumbed down the thing that he wanted to say, even though he was working in the animation space. And, mm. you know, a lot of people assume, oh, that's just geared towards children. Right. Children have an incredible sort of, um, you know, mindset. I, I love... Uh, educators like um uh uh mr rogers you know what i mean like like people who understood how to take complex ideas break them down for children um and to kind of like feed them to you in this really beautiful way and i think Hayao miyazaki understands that he's a japanese filmmaker known for films like spirited away and castle in the sky one of my favorites and those films changed my life as a kid and pretty was sort of my my uh, attempt to put put somebody that looked like me into that world, into that space. So those are the three people. We can eat lunch all day, go to movies, go on a picnic. I want to talk to them. <laughs> cool. Well, Terrence, um, how can we grown folk connect with you, contact you? Please give us all of your social media information. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, well, it is uh, Terrence, my first name, T-E-R-R-A-N-C-E, -E, my middle initial, which is the letter D as in David, followed by my last name, Day, uh, D-A-Y-E. So Terrence mm -hmm. D. Day. Um, and you can find me at Instagram. Um, predominantly, I would say, is where you'd find uh, in the most updates about me. And if you want to follow along or, or reach out and contact me, Instagram is the best way. Wonderful. Well, Mr. Terrence Day, thank you for dropping by Wyatt. Man, thank you. I should also mention uh, uh, for anybody who wants updates on Pretty and all things Pretty, you can also follow um, uh, Pretty Not Pretty, which is P R I T T Y, not Pretty, P R E T T Y. <laughs> um, and that's what we're, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, and you can find more about uh, the book as well as where to purchase it, as well as where to pre order the second installment in the series together um, online as well. Um, so uh, please uh, support, participate, um, spread the word. Like I said, independent project, we're still raising money. Right. And so um, uh, all that word of mouth um, counts to helping us get the project um, to a place that we can get the attention of some of these industry people um, to say, hey, there's an audience that's hungry for this kind of content that wants to see this kind of work, um, you know, we need to be a part of the conversation. So uh, thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Wyatt, for this platform. Listen, my friend, like I said before, earlier on, I want to be just like you when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much for dropping by. Wyatt, you must come back. I sure will. Yeah. So y'all, there you have it. You can find the official Wyatt podcast page at WyattEvans.com, the go-to a destination for LGBTQ plus news, features, commentary, and entertainment. WyattEvans.com is visited by more than 100 countries on the regular. 
All I can say to that is, hey, baby. And at WyattEvans.com, you'll find my smoking hot, H-A-W-T, hot, Nothing Can Tear Us Apart series of novels. And as you just saw on the top, Shattered. And y'all, Shattered is full of, of, of action, danger, intrigue, sexually charged situations, passion, and all of the wonderful elements that you're used to in the Nothing Can Tears Apart series of novels. So get your new copy of Shattered. Now you can follow me, your host, Wyatt O'Brien Evans, all across social media and poof! is right there for you to peruse like TikTok and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And if you have any comments or whatever, you can hit me up at quietonair at gmail.com. So until next time, y'all, woof, goddammit, woof, 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 woof. I said woof. <laughs>